Everyone connected to audio. So hi, everyone. Welcome back to Cal Entrepreneurs Week 7. Yes, I went and figured out what week we're in. It is 7. Uh, pretty crazy. This quarter is going by like super fast, but also really slow. So I'm kind of confused. But um, I hope everyone's having a great Week 7. I know things are getting super busy. Um, so we appreciate you coming out. We love, we love it when people come and take a break from education and all that stuff and come to Cal Poly Entrepreneurs. Uh, today's going to be super dope. Um, so I hope you're excited. We're going to be starting super soon. Uh, I think we have one person who is giving a little business pitch. So I want to take care of that um, before we get started. A uh, little run. Yeah, I'll do rundowns after that. <clears throat> uh morgan is morgan here hello hi hey, everyone uh sweet hi morgan uh kaylin can you give morgan uh screen share permission so morgan we're just gonna start start now and then so yeah so morgan's gonna be pitching his um little startup idea and it's all yours morgan okay screen is visible yeah Yep, you're good. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Morgan, and uh, I'm presenting a project that I've been working on called Tractor Hacking. So, a little bit about me. Um, I've been here for a long time. I'm working on my second degree, so I have a lot of, like, been here for a while, and I have a lot of uh, business experience also in uh, large companies and also ag tech startups. And so this is kind of my first attempt at creating an ag tech startup, and so it's called Tractor Hacking, um, and it started as a capstone project and it's been for this whole time an open source project and it's now transitioning to a viable business. So currently the team is me, a designer and a team of seven engineers here at Cal Poly. And uh, the, basically the main problem we're trying to solve is that farmers and farm owners, anyone that owns heavy machinery can't diagnose a tractor for problems. Uh, and this is a, if you look up, there's a lot of documentaries online to read more about this, but basically our vision is to empower farmers, independent farmers to be able to make decisions about the data without having to pay a lot of money for like really expensive open, like um, tools from the manufacturer. So we're, prov we're building this um, product right here. So this is our, um, the application that allows the uh, farmer to read diagnostic data from their tractor. And here is the hardware that actually connects to the tractor to pull all of the data off. So we've been working on this prototype for quite a while, probably six months now on this prototype. And so we're looking for like business people because we are all engineers and we need to really start reaching out to customers and start, you know, getting our first set of customers uh, as we finish up this MVP. So the customers that you'd be talking to would be regular old farmers, you know, mechanics who actually see a lot of vehicles and also like farm owners who might want, you know, features that are aggregated over a lot of different pieces of equipment. And uh, the impact of, of what you'd be doing is um, based on my like basic analysis, you got this many tractors in the US, 10 to 15% fail. So you're looking at, if you charge 250 to 300 a diagnostic, that's around 300 million a year. Um, so basically our business model we're looking at is if you're familiar with Comma AI, they're an open source tool that provides driver assistance programs. We want to emulate their open source idea, which is you take code that's open source, but you provide a kit for someone to use right out of the box and service and support for that kit. Um, another example would be the whoop strap, which is a human diagnostic tool. And so as a tractor diagnostic, our sensors are also fairly cheap. So our pricing model would be similar to this, uh, uh, basically a free piece of hardware and then a subscription service for diagnostics on a tractor this is our idea for pricing but we're really looking for someone to help us because we're really motivated to get this to market soon so our goal is to finish the mvp over in the next three months and go to market this summer potentially through the accelerator or through the innovation quest and then from there um, once we achieve that product market fit the goal is just to grow and scale from there so we're looking for students that have that want project experience in business development so if you're interested in marketing sales or just like basically overall go to market strategy like i'd love to hear from you at this link down here um you can just fill out a really short survey so we can get in touch and like i said we're really focused on growing quickly so there's plenty of room for like basically immediate like growth and continuation to work on this project if you feel like you fit with our team if you have like any like maybe like small questions to ask or, or something like that. You, this is my phone number. You can just text me, send me an email, or if you want to DM me right now on Zoom, I'd be happy to answer your questions. So thank you all for 
for being here and listening to my pitch. I'm looking forward to hearing from some of you soon. Sweet, thank you so much. Uh, Morgan, if you want, put your contact info in the chat so that way people can reach out to you. Sweet, so uh, all right, we'll do announcements for us at the end and we'll just get started. So again, if you're just tuning in, welcome back to Cal Plan Entrepreneurs week seven. Um, today we have a very cool and special opportunity to have Rich and Gary, actually Gary hasn't joined yet, I don't think so, from Cliff Bar. Uh, yeah, I just texted him. I, I hope he's coming on. I know there was some questions about the calendar today, so. Okay, sweet. Um, um, until then, I mean, we'll get started. Uh, it's all good. Um, yeah, so we have, if you didn't see on Instagram and on the Slack channel, we released a form for any questions for the Q&A. We decided to have that process through earlier. So for the Q&A, we're going to be going through those first. Um, if you do have a chat, put it in the chat box and uh, we'll just have to get to that after we're done with all the ones that were um, put in the Google form. So uh, hi, Rich, I guess we're starting with you today. Um, we'll start off with just some introductions and then we'll, I have some questions to get everyone on the same page um, and then people can just start open Q and A. So okay. the floor is yours. Yeah, and first I, I like to, I know you're all here to see Gary. Um, he's the, the star of the show here. Um, uh, but I, I am also a Cal Poly alum. I graduated in 1994, uh, finance major, and I started at Cliff Bar in 1999. Um, so I, that was seven years after Cliff Bar was was invented and and on on the market. So I have seen a lot um, in my last 22, almost 22 years at Cliff Bar. Um, and I've seen a lot of entrepreneurial growth. I've seen a lot of um, solutions that were developed and and a pretty awesome. Um, story and, and, and culture. So, um, so if he doesn't come on, uh, you might have to get the B rated version and that's me. So, but I have seen a lot there and I would be happy to share any of my experiences with you guys. Um, and, but I do hope Gary does, does step on. So. hundred percent. Uh, I, I totally trust, uh, you to take the wheel. Um, I'm very excited regardless. Um, Cliff Bar is super dope, and the chat box has been saying how much we love Cliff Bar. It's my personal snack for driving home from slow to LA. It's my number one thing that I take with me. Uh, so I, I'm going to start off with some questions, and then we'll hop into those Google Form ones. Again, if you have a question, drop it in the chat, and I'll get to those later in the meeting. So in an interview, I, some of these questions are tailored towards Gary and things he said, but... Um, Regardless. Let's try it. Let's, so he, let's try it. So he mentioned before in a uh, interview with the Good Business Network that initially, you know, Cliff Bar was just this, you know, just he just wanted to create a better tasting energy bar and there was no corporate responsibility, nothing attached to that. At what point did that change? And like, what was the reason for deciding, like, I can do this really crazy thing with this company? Oh, good. Well, actually, I was there for that. So, yeah, I mean, the idea of a Cliff Bar was just born really on a, on a, on a extremely long bike ride, eating too many power bars. And he got down to the end and he had, he had to eat, but he didn't want to take another power bar down. He said, um, you know, he had some powdered donuts, you know, to get some energy. And then he went home and he said, I, I can make a better energy bar. Went to his mom's kitchen and, and developed it, launched in 1992. 10 years later in um, 2002, um, he decided, you know what, I could do this not only did I make a better energy bar and we're starting to grow, but um, I've always wanted to do it in a, in a socially responsible way. I mean, not only do I use the best ingredients, but what happens if I started using organic ingredients? And let's say I can start using clean energy. I mean, I mean, he, he I know he grew up in Fremont, but he was, it was a Berkeley company and it's a very progressive um, area. And this was starting to be talked about. So he said, well, how, how can I start using business to do better? And that's, that's where it was born, really, right then. He hired an ecologist who was also at another Cal Poly grad named Elisa Hannon. And she said, yeah, you could do business to do good. So she started giving him ideas, and we developed a triple bottom line company. Actually, we used five bottom lines, and that's what helped govern how we, how we uh, make decisions in business. So uh, Back then, it was, it was pretty, pretty amazing because not a lot of companies were doing it. 
Yeah, so those uh, five aspirations that y'all call it, how were you making sure when you first introduced that in early 2000 that um, you were actually hitting all five of those things, you know, especially with the amount of revenue that was coming in, like how were you allocating, you know, financially and just like mentally, you know, for the vision of the company? Well, it wasn't perfect. Um, again, it, this, this stuff takes practice, right? So um, let, me, let me give you a, a case in point. So Cliff Bar was not organic in, in 2001 and it wasn't growing. Um, a Luna Bar was growing more than Cliff Bar, but none of, we didn't use any organic ingredients because we couldn't afford them and there wasn't enough supply. Um, so Gary said, hey, let's, let's start using organic ingredients. Let's use 70% organic ingredients. And I was the C well, I wasn't the CFO, but I was doing the analysis going, well, God, that's going to cost a lot of money, Gary. He's like, okay, well, how about this? Let me drop the price so we can get more scale. And I go, what? You, you, you want to drop the price and increase the cost of ingredients. Why do you want to do that? Why, why are you going to sacrifice margin? He goes, because I want to make organic ingredients more accessible to people and I have a platform now to do it. I'll say, okay, well, um, so I modeled it out and I said, well, if you can pull this off, yeah, we'll have less margin, but if we can grow with the lower price bar, right, more consumers are going to have it. It's going to increase our organic. Our brand's going to be much better and it actually could help our business because back then we had a ton of debt and we had to pay off that debt and you pay off debt with dollars, not margin percentages. So it started the, um, you know, just the thinking that, hey, this is progressive, it's unorthodox thinking, uh, but you have to start using it in the eyes of the consumer, in the eyes of the planet, um, and also within your business. So we had three of the five of the, of the aspirations in that decision, and it worked. From then on, it took off. Now, there's other things at play here too, but those were two major things, and that's what started to get organic, um, at least in the energy bar world. Um, a lot more awareness. Nice, thank you for that. Um, so I'm but actually- But it's, yeah. Armin, just like in, in, you guys deal with in, in your life, right? There's trade-offs everywhere, right? You always have to make trade-offs. It's just, you wanna make sure the trade-offs are, are um, not just hitting your business aspiration or just your planet. They all have, you have to hit at least two, three, hopefully all five of them. Because if you do, the sum of those will make it, will make it better over time. But but it's tough. It really is. For reference, what what are those five aspirations? So no, sorry. Uh, it's a uh, business, uh, brand, people, community, and planet. So business and brand pretty close, right? You have a good strong business. You're gonna have to have really strong brand equity, right? And people know you. They're aware of you. People, you have to have really good people working for you, and really good stakeholders too. Yeah, I know you guys all know what stakeholders are, right? It's your suppliers, it's your customers, it's your consumers, it's your government officials, it's your banks. Everything, everyone has who has a, a hand in your business is a stakeholder, and those are your people, and you want to make sure you keep them happy. So um, it doesn't always mean like going after a low-cost supplier. You want suppliers in your, in your stable for the long term, right? Good long-term relationships um, really help a company like Cliff Bar. Um, then the planet's the sustainability play and then communities is what we get back to our community, so. Yeah, I mean, and Cliff Bar has done some pretty like unique things, like 20% is owned by employees, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, thousands of community service hours is put in. So it, it's just a really interesting and different <laughs> type of business model that you don't see in many places. Um, which is why- And the good thing now, like these are, I know you guys are probably hearing about ESG, you know, environmental, social, and um, governance. So that's, that's key around. Right? People are looking for companies who are doing good in the world. And we've been doing that for a while. So we've already had a head start. Doesn't mean we're great at it, but at least we have a head start. And I'm really happy to see all these other companies doing it because it's now starting to show up in valuation. Um, you know, companies out there that um, have these screens and filters, like I want to invest in companies that are good for the environment, right? They're going to get higher valuation because they're on certain types of indexes. Um, there's activists shareholders now that are really holding people accountable within the company, you know, the management team um, really accountable and the board accountable. So it's, it's, it's starting to take fire now and, um, and it's really, really exciting. 
Uh, yeah, um, definitely. It's super interesting. I when I was reading about it, it, it was just blowing my mind. You know, every step of the way, I was like, "That's even more like crazy than the other." I want to hop into some of these uh, open Q and A questions. Um, if you don't have, when I I'm gonna call you, uh, unmute your, unmute your mic. If you don't remember a question, I'll ask it for you. Um, so uh, Camille, if you want to start us off. Camille. I don't think Camille's here. Okay. okay. Uh, then let's move on. I won't ask her a question for her. Michelle, Michelle J. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, so Mike or Michelle Jenkins, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. Just want to make sure. Um, my question was, I think pretty much what made you confident that Cliff Bar was differentiated from any other energy bar? And specific, I think the operative word here is confidence. Like, what made you decide to like invest in this business and devote time, energy, resources, money, et cetera, to this? What made you so confident that it was different? Great question for Gary, right? But um, yeah, but it works both ways. But, uh, no, it's taste. I he got his confidence because it was, I mean, at that time, energy bars were like a, um, like a, um, a pill, right? You, so you eat it, it's going to give you uh, function, but not a lot of taste, right? Gary was confident that not only is it, you're getting, you know, a low glycemic, really good energy product, but it tastes really, really good. Right. So that's, that's what gave him the confidence. And once you got people hooked on the taste of it, and they were sitting, they were touting it. It's like, oh, this is the best tasting energy bar. There's nothing else like it. And, you know, Power Bar was the first, well, it's actually Tiger's Milk. You guys probably don't even know what that is, but that was like the first one. But Power Bar is really the one that put energy bars on the map, right? They, um, they were the pioneers, but we were more of the settlers. We, we came in right after that and, and we, had, we had the better taste and, and they couldn't compete with us on taste. So that's, 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 that was a confident builder right there. And food, it has to taste good. Just like in technology, it has to work. It has to work consistently, right? In food, it has to taste good. It has to be consistent. How much have the uh, the three original flavors changed since they've been created and taste-wise, if you would know? Oh, so I think the only one left is peanut butter. Um, they've gotten... They've gotten much better from a texture standpoint. I don't know if you guys know this. I mean, these, these used to be made pretty much by hand by people. Now they're made by, by multi-million dollar machines uh, at our two bakeries. And they're made like, I mean, they're, it's like, it's like Wooly Wonka's chocolate factory. We're just pumping the stuff out left and right. And it's amazing that they, they've kept great taste and great texture all these years and actually better. I mean, they have a longer shelf life now um, the ingredients are more nutritious or organic, um, to do this at a scale that we've done it at, it's been pretty, pretty remarkable, um, over time. I think Gary was working at, um, a bakery, right? When things first started, um, was that family owned? Yeah, that was his bakery. Uh, they, he made, uh, they're called Yohas. Uh, think of like a Greek calzone. Them. So his, his grandmother was Greek and that's where he got the love of food. Um, yeah, so she, she instilled, I mean, he, he used to make um, puff pastry um, with her all the time growing up. Gary's a, he's a big time foodie. And he, he thought, yeah, no, this, you know, I have a bakery. I, I wanna, I wanna, and I make cookies. I make these yohas and, and, and that was the start of that, that movement. And yeah, it was family owned. He just owned it and he had a partner. Uh, but it wasn't making tons of money, and he had to work at Avocet, which is a, a bike um, seat company um, out of Italy who distributes here in the United States. Uh, they make bike computers, and I don't know if they're still around, but they were pretty big back then. So he was doing that to supplant his income so he can use that money to fund in Cliff Bar uh, because he thought the taste was was the best thing. But But the bakery business was hard, very hard. But he loved it, though. Yeah, I mean, he got into, you know, Cliff Bar, so I guess uh, he had to enjoy it to do it. Um, I'm going to 
move on to the ne next question uh, from Lane. Lane isn't here because he has to take a finance exam. So I'm going to ask this on his behalf. Poor guy. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do you, um, it was actually addressed to you too. So what do you two believe was the primary contributing factor towards um, Cliff Bar success? Did timing or luck play a larger role? I know it was like during the time of um, like, organic foods and like that entire movement of better eating was happening um or was it just achieved through product excellence and you know marketing strategy Ooh. well there was it you know you know what they say about luck right luck is um opportunity meets preparation you guys ever heard that saying before yeah Cal Poly kids are so smart. We, we're not as smart back in our day like you guys are now. Um, but yeah, no, it's um, we were at the right place at the right time. I mean, it wasn't just energy bars. It was portable nutrition, right? People were becoming more on the go and they can't, you know, it's hard to have a bowl of cereal in the morning when you're trying to get in your car and go somewhere. Um, cycling was getting in, was getting popular at the time with, you know, in the early 2000s with Lance Armstrong and, and, and that whole that whole um, genre of, of uh, sports, um, outdoors. I mean, it was just, it was a perfect food, um, not just for sports, but just to do every single day. And, and you guys are all, it's for students, I mean, it's great portable nutrition. Um, and that's why, that's literally why these nutrition bars were, were born at the time. If you look now, I mean, there's tons of nutrition bars out there. There's, there's a nutrition bar for anything, probiotics to, to um, low glycemic, to keto. I mean, all that stuff is because a bar is great portable nutrition and that's it. And, and we, as I said, we weren't the pioneers of it, but we were pretty damn close up front um, to catch, catch that wave with a really great product. And the second thing too was, you know, you guys ever up until a couple of years ago, did you ever see a Cliff Bar commercial? No, because we never did it. It was all word of mouth. It was all going to events and saying, hey, try this, try that. So people always, had like a, this emotional attachment to Cliff Bar, like it was a discovery item and that no one else had it, right? It was, it was, um, it was this funky little company out of California and um, that's how it grew. That's how the tribe grew over time until it went mainstream. And then it, then it was somewhat like Gatorade, like Gatorade had that same thing. It was for a need, right? It was for hydration. Um, but then it took on all these other things, right? People on the couch reading it, gamers are drinking it, hangover cure. I mean, all that stuff. I mean, People can use Gatorade for anything, and that's uh, that's when you hit it big when it goes mainstream. Did I answer the question? Yeah, you hit it. Yeah. Oh, there was a chat there about Greek food. I just want to make sure I caught that. There was. Um, Can't so confirm Greek food is fire. <laughs> Greek food's pretty damn good. I, I love Greek food, by the way, and I'm Italian. I can say that. Are there just like a bunch of, are just cliff bars everywhere in the, you know, offices and stuff, just baskets of cliff bars? I got to ask. Unlimited supply of cliff yes, bars. Yes, Armin, there is, but I haven't been in the office in 11 months. So, okay. yeah. I actually had to buy cliff bars through our direct to consumer portal. Really? <laughs> my house because we, we're not in the office right now. Oh, that's so um, exciting. But it's not just cliff bars all around the office, there's a ton of food around the office. It, it is a food company, first and foremost. Um, we have an awesome cafe where the employees, we used to go eat every day. Um, uh, Gary's uh, nephew, who actually worked in R&D on the Z-Bar product, uh, he's the head chef there, and they make everything from pizzas to uh, organic hamburgers to uh, lamb euros. I mean, it's, it's legit. So it, there's food all over that company. Um, that's part of our culture. Sweet. Um, moving on, Yash. I hope I uh, pronounced your name right. Let me know if I didn't. You got it. Sweet. Do you remember your question or do you? Um... I, I do. It kind of got answered already. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think specifically I'd asked uh, back then with all the energy bars kind of on the market, uh, what, what kind of made, and you know, this was based in, well, you'd mentioned that Gary grew up in Fremont and then this was kind of a Berkeley idea. This all happened at the start of Silicon Valley and at that becoming big. So what kind of pushed, um, the, the founders of, of Cliff Bar into 
the energy bar line and with all of it on the market, what was kind of the unique value proposition at the time when you first launched it? Because it went through a couple of iterations, if I'm not wrong, right? With Gary's bars and, and such and uh, until it became what it is now. Okay. Um, yeah, well, Gary's not a very, he's not a tech person. As, as I mentioned, he grew up with food. He grew up being in the outdoors. Um, when he went to Cal Poly, I think he lived in, a, in an old schoolhouse. Um, so he's, he's always been more into nature, not in technology. So, um, and Gary always does things, you know, again, a little more unorthodox. So yeah, even though it was the dot-com boom, he stuck with what he thought was the right thing. And the dot-com boom really didn't start, you know, until like 1996, 97. Um, and he already had clip bar going in 1992. So, um, but yeah, I went through a lot of different transitions, but again, it was just one of those things where he made this thing. He went out, he, he, he sampled it to people at natural food shows and in bike shops, right? Which that's not a huge market. Um, but the real big um, breakthrough was Trader Joe's. So Trader Joe's came on the scene. Um, they were offering good, like the tape type of food, right? Uh, wasn't so much organic at the time, but it was very natural, um, good price, a lot of variety, um, a lot of different brands. And really, I mean, when Trader Joe's, there's a high correlation when Trader Joe's is really starting to take off here in the United States, Cliff Bar was on the same path. And they're a great customer. They, they paid on time. They didn't, they didn't um, you know, nickel and dime you for all these promotions. So they, they saw the proposition like, yeah, this could be really good portable nutrition. And, um, and we really grew with them really from 1994, 1995 to until we start to go mainstream in 20, you know, 20 or uh, was it, yeah, 2002, 2003. So I hope that answers the question. Um, you know, that would be something Gary could talk about, but I just know that he just, he just loves the outdoors and, and he hates sitting in an office. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Yeah, oh, he likes things that are tangible too. That's, remember I talked about the bike seat. So Avisad had this gel insert that he actually developed um, that put Avisad on the map too. So he's got that mind of trying to find solutions. He's just not doing it with technology. He's doing it with just real tangible items. Like, hey, I'm a cyclist and my, and my ass hurts and I need a better seat, right? So he did, he developed that. I'm a cyclist. I need a better, better tasting food. So he, he developed the clip bar and he still has that mind new. He's still trying to figure out how do I solve like snacking? You know, how do, how do I get better snacks out there right now? Because clip bar is an energy bar. It's, I mean, it's, it's good for you guys. You know, you guys are young and active um, and you're probably going from class to class and you don't have time to eat, but you know, I can't sit at a desk all day and eat a cliff bar. I need like a nut butter filled bar. Cause I know there's a question, what's my favorite flavor? I think that came up. My favorite product is nut butter filled because it's lower in sugar, um, it's hundred percent organic and it just has a better taste profile for me. And it's more of a snack. I can eat it every day and not feel guilty. So. That's been a long line of Cliff Bar. All the products we've made after Cliff, Luna Bar, Builders Bar, there's a need behind it. But what, what has to happen with all those, it has to taste good. All right, uh, Tommy, Tommy Caps. It's Tommy here. Tommy going once, Tommy going twice. Okay, uh, Xavier. No, okay. Uh, Shea Friedman. Okay, sweet. Uh, we'll move on to. There's someone in the chat here. There is. Yeah, I'm going. I'm gonna go to the chat now. Oh, okay, got it. Sorry. Are online. No worries. Okay. Scrolling all the way to the top. Let's see. <clears throat> all right, uh, Christopher. Christopher C. Hello. How's it going? Um, Good. My, my question was just, it's kind of generic, but how has COVID affected sales? Because you see a lot of people are isolating, but then on the other hand, you see a lot of people taking the chance to now explore the outside and somewhat of a, you know, because it's outdoors, a little bit safer to be outdoors than inside with people. Uh, how have you seen, you know, um, Cliff Bar sales affected by COVID? Yes. Um... 
Okay, so there's two stories here. Um, our Z bar line, you know, the kids bar, um, has actually done really, really well because uh, it's better value. Uh, kids are at home and parents have been been filling up pantries, right? So their kids can have uh, something to eat at home because at school there's less control. They don't know what they're going to be eating and and and, and getting other than in their lunchbox. So, so Z bar is a new as a we call it a wholesome bar. So Z bar. Uh, Quaker Chewy bars, um, Rice Krispie treats, all those bars have had a had a really good, really good um, sales run here th through COVID. Um, nutrition bars, on the other hand, Cliff Bar, Kind Bar to an extent, um, some of the high protein bars, not so good, right? Even though people are are testing the outdoors more and they're doing more, that's that's great. But we need people on the go. We need people going to soccer practice, going to school. Uh, going to events, traveling, that's, that's, that's makes up the other half of the nutrition bar um, proposition. And when you don't have that, it's hurting our sales. So um, yeah, this is the first year I've seen us been down in a really long time. So have you been pivoting a little bit more and trying to focus more on the uh, Z bar then? Yeah, we have been, we have been, there's still a ton of room for growth on Z bar. Um, I think it's in, we like to measure based on households. So think of it in, in 100 households, right? 23 people buy a Cliff Bar in the last year, 23 out of 100. So it's, it's pretty good. Uh, 11 has been Z Bar. And there's a lot of kids out there, right? So if, if Z Bar can get to the same level as Cliff Bar, then we'll be looking pretty good. So, so COVID has not, not, not helped us just because of the, the portability. Oh, there's Gary. Hold on. I'm going to go on mute. Is on Vita here? Just real quick. Yeah. Hi. Uh, after, for meetings, uh, do you mind doing another announcement for the uh, AMA collab event tomorrow? For meetings tomorrow? What do you mean? No, no, no. Okay. It's the 17th, right? The, the Shark Tank event. Can you give a little? Oh, yes. At the end. Oh, right now? No, no. At the end. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, there he is. Hi, Gary. I'm, I'm so sorry. No worries. Just walked in my house in Berkeley. I was on the freeway. All good. Um, traffic. Um, how, are, how are you all doing? Good. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, let me just uh, turn the volume up. Good to go. Sweet. Um, thanks for joining us, Gary. Uh, we have just been going at it, asking all the questions, and um, Rich has been covering for you pretty well. Um, we have oh, some thanks. questions that <laughs> for sure. He should, he should cover for me really well. He's one of my closest friends at Cliff Bar for many, many years, 20, and he's he's been on many of those uh, journeys with me over in the Alps, so in the Dolomites, so he knows Cliff Bar as good as anybody. Yeah, I'm sure he, he answers some questions like verbatim the way you would. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we, I talked about Avocet, Gary, and solving problems yeah. with the gel seats to, you know, th th this group here of students, they, they know, they, they, they know it was called the Gary Bar at one point. Um, they're pretty well, well educated on the history of Cliff Bar and, cool. and, um, and the Yohas, you know, we talked about that as well. Jeez. So. You got like 50, I'm looking here, you got 53 people. Oh man, I feel bad, even worse. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, well, hey, we'll have a little time. Let's 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 roll. Yeah, let's roll. Uh, so I do have one more question that I was waiting to ask, uh, ask you. So what were you doing at the time when you decided to take up, you know, because, you know, you said you were on the mountain. I've, I've heard this story a bunch of times because I watched like every interview you have, but you said you were on the mountain and you turned around and you're just like, I can make a better energy bar than this. Yeah. But what, what were you doing at the time that you're like, you know what, I'm going to, instead of just proving I can make a better bar, I'm going to make that better bar. I'm going to pick it up as my full-time project, you know? So what was I doing like in the background work or? Yeah. 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 So at that time um, I was still working part-time for the bicycle company. Um, I was designing, um, this, that's my, that's one of my best friends. This, the guy I was with on the trip, that's not him, but we were all three buddies in high school together. <laughs> that's awesome. 
<laughs> um, in fact, I ski powder skied with Jay last Friday, the guy I did the epiphany ride with. Um, and we just keep reminiscing about the whole thing. And now he's an ER doctor helping patients uh, survive COVID and, and many other things, many other uh, ER situations. Um, so I was still working part-time um, designing bicycle seats. And, um, but I, I double, had double duty. I owned the bakery too, which was um, at that point, we started in 1986 with the Yohas and Cookies. And that was about our fourth year in business and we were still losing money, but um, we were growing and Yohas was about to go. We were trying to, that was gonna be my big product. That was gonna be the one that, you know, uh, turn the world around for me. And it was going national. Um, but, and, but I was eating a lot of power bars at the time too, um, when I was racing bicycles. Um, and so it all just kind of came together that one moment that I, I think everything, and if you did read some of the stuff, um, I think the collision between having a bakery where I knew I could, it was like, uh, it was like getting a degree in business. It, it wasn't um, overextending myself. It wasn't like getting a bunch of venture capital and, and trying to start this business where um, if it failed, it would be a big failure. If I failed at the bakery, it wouldn't have been that bad. I wouldn't have lost a lot of money, but I was able to learn how to run a business. And, and at the same time, I was in this world of bike racing where I was watching this product power bar go from zero to a thousand in a couple of years and everybody was eating them and I, how you don't need to raise your hand how many people have ever had the original power bar in there it's it was one person rich uh, it was awful um but we ate it because it was the bitter pill um so, and then working in the bicycle industry, that's where Power Bar got started. So I understood that industry and I understood how to distribute to bike shops. So it all just collided in one moment and um, it just made sense. Yeah, totally. It was kind of just like opportunity was there and just, yeah, I totally get that. So we have some questions in chat. I wanna talk as little as possible so I can give everyone else the opportunity. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris, I don't know if you want to ask, but uh, Rich already answered that. What his favorite flavor of Cliff Bar is? Um, what is yours, Gary? Sorry, I just realized I I just asked for you, Chris. You can hate me later for that. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a it's like many things that foods I like. You know, one day I feel like this flavor, and one day I feel like that flavor. Um, I'm a little fond of the original apricot flavor. Um, that same best friend, we, we all three grew up in uh, Fremont, um, California. If anybody knows, it's, it's now considered part of the Silicon Valley. And we grew up around apricot orchards and they were, apricot orchard was in my backyard. So I'm, I'm really fond of that flavor. Um, lately, I've been back into peanut butter. I've been crunchy peanut butter. I don't know, just I kind of go around. Um, so can I pitch you a flavor? Sure. Let me write that down. Go ahead. What is yeah. it? Apple, apple and peanut butter flavor. Apple and peanut butter. Never heard yeah, of that. I think that I think that would be good. Never heard of that idea. Uh, Rich, can you take a note on that? <laughs> yeah, that'd be good for like Z bar. Yeah, because people do take apple and they put peanut butter on apples. Would be okay. I'll keep you posted. And that's Chris. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks. How do you guys? Uh, how do you guys enjoy like the uh, the kind bars though, or the other uh, your competition? The time time bars. The, the kind Kind, bar. oh, kind bars. Actually, I'm there was a, there was a bar in the early day time from the time bicycle pedals. They came out with a bar like power bar. Um, well, I don't enjoy them because I don't really eat them. <laughs> um, I think we make I think we make great product. Uh, yeah, they're they're one of our top competitors. Um, but they do use corn syrup and they don't say it. <laughs> we don't like that. Uh, to stay on the topic of flavors, Avi, Avi, let me know which one is yeah, right. Avi. 
you want to ask? I, I just wanted to ask what the the best and worst flavor you guys have tasted that never ended up getting produced. Because I'm sure that like when you guys are sort of prototyping flavors, yeah, you might taste some and, and mm. not end up producing. Mm. Oh, I may need rich for that. Um, but I tell you the best one, um, and this this is rich does connect with this. Uh, on our 20th anniversary, we had a flavor called Pan Forte. Uh, Pan Forte is an ancient recipe from Italy, um, probably around the world too. Um, and it's um, it's got a lot of spices in it. It's from, if you've ever been, if you're fortunate to ever have gone to Tuscany um, in Siena, they're famous for Pan Forte. It's nuts held together with syrup that's really dense. Um, it has cardamom, um, cinnamon, nutmeg, clove. And we made that flavor in, in, um, in our 20th anniversary in 2012, right? 12, 20, yeah, 2012, 20 years after, right? Yeah. And the problem was it was it was very good, but it was the most expensive. What was our margin on that? Like one yeah. percent. It, it was so expensive, but it was cool, and it was like this celebration. And so that was the best. I think that was one of the best flavors we've ever done. And if we could bring it back, I would. I don't know about bad flavors. Um, Other than Luna Glow. Yeah. 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 You know, our that was our low carb 2004. We were chasing the, the low carb phase and it just didn't it was chalky and had sugar alcohols it wasn't it went against our our um, food philosophy because I was the students Gary like this stuff I mean what makes why, why were you so confident that you wanted to put your 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 life and heart into cliff bar it's because it tasted good yeah I mean it was the best tasting not just energy bar but any portable nutrition any type of portable nutrition it was just good yeah and that's what differentiated us. And, and it has to taste good. And if it doesn't taste good, it does. It's not going to. Um, it's not going to succeed. Yeah, we were able to, um, at the, at the time, and this is way back. Uh, we changed the category, and then now there's hundreds of bars out there that a lot of them taste good. I have, yeah. I have to admit, you know, like in the, I'm we're in the wine business too. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's funny because the, our competitors in the bar business, we don't seem to like each other. We're very competitive and we snark at each other. And um, some of them we get along with, some of them we don't. Um, in the wine business, everybody gets along. They're all, we're all friends um, up in Napa Valley. And we compare wines, we go to parties with them and they're like, hey, try this thing. I just, I just, you know, made this wine and that wine and they pull stuff out of their garage that they've had for like 10 years and they're pulling it out. And, um, and so I think over the years, there have been a lot of good competitors out there. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I give them, I give them credit, but, um, you know, thank God, uh, they're not all tasting like the original power bar. I don't even know if they make the original power bar anymore, but it's it's worth a try if you can find one. Hopefully they don't, right? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go into a little bit more businessy questions. Okay. Uh, Kaylin, do you wanna start us off? Sure, yeah, I wanted to ask a little bit about how, so Rich mentioned that you started Cliff Bar, making bars by hand and you know mixing, and then he talked about how, how today you're producing at scale, with these huge machineries, I was just wondering if you could share more insight on like the, the kind of process of how the bars are made, or, or maybe how you how you made that transition all the way from you know by hand to, to fully automated scale. Mm -hmm. um, owning a small bakery, making um, the calzoni and and cookies, um, you know when I was making prototypes in my mom's kitchen. Um, I wasn't sure whether we could make it at our little bakery or not. And I wasn't thinking the scale that we're at now. 
And as, as soon as we kind of finished, I realized uh, we, we would have to buy a lot of equipment to make a cliff bar. And right down the street in Hayward, California, there was a, um, a, a, a co-manufacturing bakery that made their own brands, but they made 90% of what they did was for other, other brands. We call it co-man or co-manufacturing. And um, they made stuff for Barbara's Bakery. And um, so I, I just went over there one day and told them what I was doing. And this is like 1990. And they immediately said, well, why don't you bring over your recipe? We don't need to see it and bring over the ingredients and we'll mix it and we'll just see what happens. And um, they were super cool about me literally going into their bakery and playing with all their equipment like it was my bakery. Um, I don't know if you could do that now because people are very protective of their stuff. I mean, I was, I was pulling dies out and I knew how to machine. And so I needed to change the die so it could make it a rectangle. And um, I was literally straddling over the belt, the, 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 the oven band at 400 degrees. And um, like you could never get away with that now. It was just crazy days. And uh, we, I, as I said in my book, we blew up a mixer because our dough is really tough and uh, their mixer wasn't strong enough. What didn't have a big enough motor. Um, so I was very fortunate to have a, a co-manufacturer that was willing to um, sacrifice uh, their equipment for me. And and uh, the first month we made um, February of 1992, we had orders for 30,000 bars, and it took us a solid week to make 30,000 bars. And we had a we made a mistake with the packaging and we didn't seal them tight we didn't have the heat sealer tight, uh, uh, hot enough and we had to unpack all those bars and reseal them by hand with these little foot pedals um i mean this is the crazy stuff that when we started that i just can't believe we got through so thirty thousand bars our first month in 1992 we do thirty thousand bars now um, we do a lot. <laughs> we do like my brother, who is our the VP of engineering, said, yeah, we do like 30,000 bars in like 10 minutes now. <laughs> and it took us an entire week to do it back then. Um, I look back now and I just think those are like, those are the fun days of just figuring it out. And I think entrepreneurship is a lot about huge mistakes at the beginning, figuring it out. Don't worry about, you just got to not worry about where this is going. Just make sure it's just one step at a time and you're going to make a bunch of mistakes. Um, just don't over leverage yourself. Um, don't go way into debt. Rich has helped us over the years to, as he says, you know, Johnny Cash, cash is king. Uh, you know, cash is really important. We've been really lucky. We've never had to take on an investor. Um, we've been tempted, um, especially when we bought out, my wife and I bought out our partner in 2000. You might be wanting, you might, that might be one of your questions. How, how in the heck did we survive that? Um, did you tell that story yet, Rich? No, but I, I think what you're hitting here for, for the students, Gary, is, uh, the co-manufacturing model that we had was awesome because, you know, we didn't over lever ourselves. Um, we used the money instead of buying big equipment. We used it to to market, to innovate, um, to to get people on board, um, and let let the big guys have the assets. Right? Mm -hmm. Time, you know. So I'm going to answer the question. Over time, we got enough scale, and there's enough at stake where we didn't want other people making cliff bars anymore because um, then you're giving away all of the trade secrets, and every time these these big companies were bought by other big companies. We didn't want Nestle making a cliff bar. So in 2016, we, we built a bakery. We took over a, a bakery from a co-manufacturer. So now all cliff bars made in-house. And, um, and that's just the evolution. You have to have the scale and the timing has to work. Um, but growing up, you know, not, I mean, 
have a co-man do it. Yeah, le leverage other leverage. other businesses to do it. So do you remember the day I said to you, Rich, shoot me if we ever build a bakery? I remember that it was on the chairlift in Squaw Valley. <laughs> and now but, we have two. And now, now we, we have two of them. We play like over 800 people at our two bakeries. Talk about a fixed asset, a fixed, uh, you know, cost to our, to our business. Um, it's a huge responsibility. Uh, you know, we're, we grow, we're fine. We don't, um, that, it gets, that, it gets tough. that fixed cost really affects our, our margins. Yeah. Is everybody here business majors? We have a big divert. No, it's it's everything. Very diverse group. Yeah. Um, so we have there's about like five more questions, but I want to ask a closing question, and then if y'all want to stay longer. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I I again apologize, but if you're if you guys can drop off as you need to, but I'm I'm free for. Yeah. Great. We love hearing that. So um, just to respect everyone else's time, we'll give the closing question first, and then we'll hop back into the rest. Um, so what you know the most the generic answer we like to ask and the question we like to ask everyone is what advice would you give to you know all of us as students um student entrepreneurs so we have a lot of student entrepreneurs people thinking about yep uh, people working on people thinking about yeah in the process mm -hmm. i don't want to give a cliche answer but it might have to um I mean, you got to believe in your, your idea. And there wasn't a day that I didn't believe that Cliff Bar would do, would make it. Um, and I don't know if I was able to visualize that thing all the way from once I got it, getting it on the market and marketing it. Um, but I do think a lot of entrepreneurs do, um, they can visualize the success, how you get there is a different story. Um, so, uh, advice, um, you know, just never, never give up. Um, and I, the other advice I would be is control your destiny. So for Cliff Bar, we're the only company in our top, in the top 10 competitors that is family and employee owned. All the rest have taken on venture, private equity, or strategic, or have sold to a strategic buyer. Um, and I know many of, I've talked to some of them and they lost control of their business early, real, some of them early on. And they never really got to experience being a full entrepreneur on their own because they were always, they always had this, uh, um, not sure what the right parent a parent i was going to say something like that yeah that it's yeah. Parent. Some telling, them, telling them what they can do and what they can't do yeah and my i give my wife a ton of credit and rich live through the whole thing of keeping our company family and employee owned but if we would have taken on an investor back in 2000 when we were buying out our ex-partner the company would have turned out completely different so for the last 20 years we have had full control because we own, you know, my wife and I own the majority of the company and 20% is owned by the employees. Um, and so I would say whatever you can do, whether it's bank loans, you know, family investors, uh, start small, let it grow. And, you know, some, some businesses, it's really hard to do that with. I get that. Like if you're gonna get into tech, you know, it's hard, it's hard to even start day one without having some, some big cash, but our, we have a low barrier, barrier of entry, our product. Um, it didn't cost us a few 20, $30,000 to get into, into business and start the ball rolling. And I was able to work out a thing where I had my payables, um, I mean, I'm receivables before my payables. So I had a deal with my two big distributors, big 30,000 bars. Um, 
where they, I had COD and I gave them like a 2% discount. So I had the money before I even had to pay the co-packer. So I was, I was cash positive from the start, even though it was really small. I think that's, so control your destiny and, um, you know, if you have an idea, you're probably going to believe in that idea and just uh, don't ever give up. Oh yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, so hopping back into those questions. Um, yeah, real quick. Uh, if, if you have to head off, you have to head off. Uh, dear CP members, we have a Shark Tank. I'm just literally reading uh, Kaylin's um, message. It, we have a Shark Tank collaboration with uh, the marketing uh, club tomorrow. Check out the general Slack channel for more info. If you're not in the general Slack, Kalen will send, uh, send a link right now and um, he can talk to you more about that. Sweet, I'll be back into these questions. Uh, let me know if I pronounce your name correctly. I'm gonna try my very best. Uh, Gerasimos. Yeah, it's Gerasimos. That was pretty good. Uh, okay. that's, better than, that's better than most people get on the first attempt. I'm Middle Eastern, so I've had my fair share, like karma <laughs> for that. So. All right, cool. What page, what page you're on? Uh, who, can I see, see? Okay, go ahead and say it. Uh, this is the gentleman who says Greek food is the best. It is the best. And I might be biased, but uh, that's not the reason. So um, I have an actual question, though. So um, now with the rise of pretty popular social medias that blow up really fast, uh, specifically alluding to TikTok, how would, uh, if, if, if anything, how would uh, utilizing this social media have helped company growth if it was founded now? Hmm. So because we didn't have it at the beginning, right? And yeah, yeah. I mean, it was right? it was there, I'm sure, but not nearly oh. as prevalent as it is now. 1992. I don't. I don't think cell phones were much in 1992. Um, I didn't have a. I didn't, yeah, I had a pager. I had a pager for several years. Uh, let's see. That's a hard question. Um, I mean, you'd hope that we'd have an ocean spray uh, moment, maybe. Um, uh, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, because but, but Gary, I was telling you know, the story earlier, you know, our social media was really like physically social media, like try this, try that, use it for, it's that one-to-one, -one, not one-to-many type, type yeah. model. So in today's world, I'm trying to think like, do I, how do I buy food if I see something on Instagram or social media? Um, it's definitely, I mean, it's a powerful tool um, to get to many and, and to help build a tribe, but there's just so much. Yeah. I, if, if I was going to, I don't, I don't know. It's hard, hard to fully answer that, but I would, I think influencers is really, it's always been part of our mix, even before social media. So we sponsored um, athletes from the beginning or, you know, gave them bars and then they would talk about our product. Didn't have social media, so they couldn't do it back then, um, but they talked and then we advertised, we did print advertising with some of our athletes. Um, so yeah, I would probably try to get, uh, um, you know, influencer uh, uh, sponsorships, um, you know, but, <laughs> I'm very old school. Um, I, I don't know, you know, how, that's why we hired a digital department that, because if I ran it, I'd kill our company right now. Back then, you know, the first, the first several years, it was all guerrilla marketing for us. It was just going out to bike shop, I mean, to uh, bike events, climbing, climbing crags up in the mountains and just parking lots and just handing out bars by the, by the hundreds and then the thousands. And, and we still do that, but, um, you know, that's, that was our, that was our number one marketing tactic back then was, um, we, ca we called it guerrilla marketing or field marketing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. That's, that must be so exciting. Just like doing a hike or a long bike ride and then distributing your own product has to be a fun part of entrepreneurship. That was the heyday back then. Um, Cause we were the, we were the second bar in the market, really significant yeah. second bar in the market. And people were just going nuts. Like they could, they didn't even, they couldn't, they couldn't believe it was an 
energy bar. And I said, well, look at the, look at the, look at the nutritional facts. It's the same as power bars, just got better yeah. ingredients. And yeah. tastes better. Um, so Sophie, if you're still here, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Hi guys. Thank you again um, for your time. Um, both, both for which and for Gailey, um, you mentioned kind of those, those bumpy early days is also being the most rewarding part. Is there ever a moment where you kind of thought like, we've really made it or the opposite, like, oh no, I don't think this is going to work. Um, I don't think we're going to make it um, type of thing or that, that sticks out in your mind. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there were many days when I thought we made it and then we made it again. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, I remember in, I believe it was 90, five, three or three and a half years after, maybe it's four years after. Um, I guess I'll just share the numbers. You know, we were, we were growing it exponentially. We first year was $700,000 in sales, which was crazy because the bakery that I own, Callie's was our, our biggest year was $250,000 in revenue. And, and we lost 20 or so thousand dollars. And the first year Cliff Bar did $700,000 in mostly just bike shops. So I thought, okay, that was, we did it. <laughs> we made it. And my goal was to like build a, maybe a $2 million business. And then I could maybe make, you know, $50,000 or something, maybe a hundred thousand dollars and live, live in my garage and buy a few more, you know, toys, more bikes. <laughs> and, uh, and then it just blew up. And then it went to, then it went to 3 million, then it went to five and then it went to 10 then it went to 20. So every year was like, we made it. No, we made it again. We made it again. Yeah. And, um, but the, the turning point was when we landed Trader Joe's. Um, you all know Trader Joe's? A lot of people, I mean, they're everywhere, right? They're pretty national. Um, that doubled our business overnight. Um, it was insane. And talk about cash flow. They paid really fast. Like they paid, we gave them a 1% discount. They paid in was it 10 days, Rich? Yeah, 10 days. Yeah, 10 days. And they and that check was there in 10. Yeah. This is this is when you didn't do the wire thing. They had literally as a physical check. And it was there in 10 days. And so what happened when Trader Joe's took it, then it created this momentum where other retailers were saying, we want that product. So it just started the ball rolling. Safeway then picked it up. And then uh Kroger and then Costco and, and on and on and on. And we just needed that one, that was that one, talk about if that would have, that would have been like a, uh, an Instagram moment or a, you know, a social media moment, but it was a physical thing where it was in Trader Joe's and all the competitors look at everything Trader Joe's is doing, all the retail competitors. So uh, note to self, if you're, if depending on your business, if you can land one strategic account that can turn your business around. And it's probably not Whole Foods anymore. It used to be like for some businesses, Whole Foods was a big one. For us, it was Trader Joe's. Whole Foods, they did, they helped us, but so um, down moments. Um, I don't know. I, I've always felt pretty positive. This last year with COVID though has been a tough one. So yeah, it's been, it's been, uh, hard. I, I think, uh, uh, not, not to steal anything here, but my, my personal thought when we made it in 2009, we had a product recall, uh, not just us, but we had all the peanut butter products. Most of the peanut butter products were in this, in this massive recall in the United States. And one third of our products were off the shelf. And, you know, that's, you, you want to go through something that's that's alarming. That was alarming um, when no money's coming in because everyone's deducting because you're you're on recall, right? So they're they're dumping product, and the fastest thing to do is to get back on. Well, we actually grew that year. It was amazing. We got back on shelf. Our customers and our consumers were like, put back, right? We didn't lose. We didn't miss a beat. And then from then on, we just we took off for a second wave of growth. And um, to me, that's when I knew that. Our customers are loyal, our consumers are loyal, and um, 
and it was it was the toughest well one of the toughest years i've ever had at cliff bar but it ended up being one of the best because we were battle tested and, um, and yeah, maybe, we were stronger that, when we were done with it yeah maybe that's why i don't he's right and that was that was a moment of holy you know shit like yeah. 30 <laughs> it was was it 30 33 to 35 percent of our business was off the shelf in one in just a, a week or two um and we thought okay we're going to be 35 percent down this year on business yeah. and what happened was people said well i like i eat peanut butter all the time i'll try another flavor and they came in and they said peanut butter's off the shelf i'll try another flavor and so it actually built a lot of our other flavors back um that or uh, people were eating like our the the revenue from our other flavors grew at, almost exponentially from that. The other thing I, I learned from that is another lesson uh, would be just be transparent. Um, a lot of people that go through recalls, we found out after we went through our recall, um, it's the bullshit factor. Like um, we, we heard from a lot of our um, retailers that we handled it better than we had this, this vice president from Kroger, which is the largest grocery chain in the country, say, nobody's handled a, a recall better than you guys. You guys were honest with us. You didn't bullshit us. You didn't tell us, oh, we'll be back in two weeks. And then you're not back in two weeks. We were fully transparent with them and they appreciated just the, the honesty. So honesty goes a long way as in business. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Um, some of these people might have left, so I'm going to have to check. Nope. Yasha's still here. Uh, Yasha, you want to ask your question? Yeah. So I had two questions that are quick, I promise, for the rest of you guys waiting. Uh, the first one is a little bit more uh, down the personal line. Is my, is my info correct? Did you guys attend American High when you were in Fremont? Was that the... I, I did, and my buddy yeah. here did, too. I had a I had an old teacher who mentioned that she taught you, so that's a it's a thing of legend now. So um, what, was her, what was her name or her name? Uh, Mrs. Mahuna. Yes. Oh yeah. my gosh. She was the uh, baseball was coach my, at Patterson. Yeah, she's my mom. My mom knew her really well. My mom was a uh, grammar school teacher, and uh, she she was a very close friend of my mom's. Yeah. Yeah, she was a she was a legend back in the day as well. Um, I, I think we all loved her, but uh, yeah, no, it's uh it's cool to see that you know, have somebody out of American who actually did something. Um, so my, my question, on. question down the line of, yeah, as you can tell, I, I did attend there too. Humble. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the question I had, uh, down the business line was, um, what's kind of the, the process, uh, behind breaking into kind of a new space, because I know, you know, generally you guys handle food and, uh, but, uh, you know, moving into focusing on, products designed specifically for athletes like um like blocks was a completely different thing than than your mm -hmm. flagship product so what kind of goes into deciding to just make a product like that and how long does it take to uh from the conception to push yeah. the market yeah blocks is a um think of a, a little uh, cube of, of gummy bear but it's made with better ingredients. Um, it's essentially, we had a shot, we have a product called shot, which is a gel, like, you know, a, a energy gel. And we were listening to our, con our consumers saying, you know, it's messy, I, I don't like it. It's, you know, it's just syrupy. And we saw some other products on the market that were, weren't, weren't um, targeted towards athletes, but um, we uh, started experimenting with making shot into a, a solid form and um we ha we developed it and it sat on the shelf for like god well over a year maybe two years and i just couldn't get like come on guys we got to get this on the market this is an opportunity <clears throat> we were doing about three million dollars in shot no two or two and a half in shot at that time and finally, I just pushed the button, went into a group and said, okay, this product's coming out. We're calling it Blocks and we're going to do it. And we're going to introduce this at the show in September. It was like February. We did it. We got it all together, packaged it and everything. And that product became like 
it's it's the leader in the category now of of those kind of uh, delivery of a, of a athletic food, um, and it's doing four or five times what shot our shell did. Uh, yeah, that was an in, that was an innovation. Um, I think one of the things about what what we are able, we do um, this this old friend of mine who helped us out with innovation used to say, um, you know, innovation comes from opportunity, it, and it. It, it's 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 seeing an opportunity um yet the, the other he said but your innovation was different yours came out of vocation like yours came out of like this is what you do like you ride bikes you climb you know so i was the i was the consumer so our innovation has come out of um you know we are the consumer and a lot of a lot of innovation comes out like that um, but other people, sometimes innovation comes out of just see people see, hey, if I make, um, I'm not into widgets, but if I make a widget, I could make some money off that. And their heart's not into it, their heart's into it maybe, but it's more about just a pure opportunity. <clears throat> and I think that's what makes our products, I think a little special is that we, we live it. You know, everybody lives it. Rich has lived it. Um, we all use the product, uh, you know, every day. A little story there with shop blocks, as Gary was talking about, it came out in a pouch. So there are six in a pouch, right? And it was good at least to get the product out there, but as cyclists, fitting a pouch into a bike pouch is cumbersome, right? So Gary and the guys came up with, okay, let's do a, this thing called a fast pack. So it's a, now it's like a, think of it like a Pez dispenser and it fits perfectly in your, in your bike pouch or your backpack. You just pop them in your mouth. So it's just, you got out the you got out the innovation, and then he he innovated on the innovation. And right. packaging is really really important. Yeah, the delivery of it. So it was yeah. the product was great, but the delivery got oh, yeah. even better in the second round. We just came out with a cool new product, Cliff Thins. Um, you can check oh, it online. Yeah. Go into our website, Cliff Thins. Huh? I just got an ad for it today. It is amazing. I have to say, <laughs> that's pretty good. It's, a, it's like you take a cliff bar and you cut it paper thin and then you bake it really hard so it's really crispy. It's like a, almost like a potato chip crispy and you can't get enough of them. It's 100 calories per package, five grams of sugar. So it's not really an energy product per se. It's more like a snack food. So we're, we're diversifying into more snack foods now. We've got a couple other new products. Look at them. Look, look in our website in the next uh, week or so coming out. So. We're, on a, we're, we're getting back on a roll of innovation. Oh yeah. We've been, we've been a little idle to be completely frank. I'm very excited to try those out. But then, so. Yeah, do go check out our website because we just revamped it last year. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah, there we go. So, yeah, yeah, so, so we got there you up on good reviews Five too. Times. Good reviews. They look good. I might order them myself. Get them now before we run out. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I'm sure you will. Is it only available off of your website right now? Or uh, Walmart and, and on online on our D2C only right yeah. now. Uh, continuing on with these questions, because we got a few more, but, but uh, also just let me know whenever um, you got to step up. Uh, we'll just keep going until then. Uh, Michelle, Michelle Jenkins. Hi, Michelle. Hi all right, I just had a question. Um, do you know if Cliff has any um, plans for making more environmentally sustainable practices or packaging? Mm -hmm. This is just a question I like to ask most business representatives because in the 21st century, and especially in this coming decade, people yeah. are being a lot more green. Yeah. So packaging has been one of our Achilles heels. Um, it's something that we're not, um, well, no, nobody can be super proud in our industry of, of their packaging. And we have a, we now have a, uh, a group that is working on sustainable packaging. We're actually working on compostable packaging right now. Um, we made a commitment, 2025, what's our commitment, Rich? 2025? Um, uh, to be, uh, yeah, fully sustainable, either recycled or Compostable package. Compostable or, yeah. So we've made a lot of progress, um, but 
uh, we're feeling very hopeful about um, some of the new innovations around compostable packaging. Um, other than that, we, you know, our entire sustainability program around ingredients we're using, organic, non-GMO. Um, we run our bakeries on renewable energy. Um, we're the we're the only company that does that. Um, you know, we're climate neutral as a company. Um, we've had a sustainability program for 20 years now before the word sustainability was even a buzzword. You guys were probably in single digit ages by at that point, um, many of you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that, we've, we've come a long ways and we, but we're humble enough to know that we, we've, got, we've got a long ways to go. So, Thank you. Hey Michelle, question. just maybe for your, just for Michelle's benefit, um, and then compulsive mm -hmm. packaging would be, you know, nirvana for us, right? The only problem is, is that, I mean, we can come up with compostable packaging, but you need a system that, that could compost it, right? And then living in an area or living in certain parts of the United States, yeah, there's really good, robust, um, you know, um, compostable ways to get it done, right? In other parts of this country, there's not. Right. So you can have the innovation, but you also need the infrastructure so you can do it. That's why recycling is, I mean, that's been around for a really long time. Um, that's a little bit more mature, but to get compostable, we need to get, we need to get. Um, it's very hard to get recycled um, re, uh, film. We call it film. It's the yeah. it wraps the bar. Really hard to get recycling uh, on that part. But yeah, it'll probably be compostable. But then Rich is right. It's where are you going to compost it? Uh, let's hope that that grows across the country where you just put it in your your green you know dispenser green and it's composted. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Ethan, I think you're next. Might have stepped out. Okay. No, Ethan's right there. Or is another Ethan? There's Ethan. Oh, oh no. No? Okay. No? Okay. I think Ethan, I think he might be muted. There. I think you're muted again. I thought I know. I think you meant another Ethan because another Ethan. Okay. Oh, okay. Hey, Ethan. All right, so um, Maddie, uh, the person who asked this question stepped out, but I actually want to know what the answer is to it. Uh, he said, verbatim, this is a long shot, but have you guys thought about doing a CBD style bar for extra recovery? Uh, it has been tossed around. Um, uh, it's, it's a tough one because of regulations and um, I'm actually a fan of CBD because um, I've had a lot of injuries <laughs> and, uh, and I have friends in the industry and, um, but I think it's, it's a stretch for us because of a lot of the regulation. I will, I will refer your answer to him. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, and then Matthew. Yep. Hey Gary, uh, I was wondering, how do you make your teammates feel like the company is also theirs and it wasn't just like me who recruited them? Because I suspect right now um, with the project I'm working on, communication isn't so great because um, they don't feel like it's, it's like th this is their baby as well. Um, say that again, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the essence. I was just wondering, like, how do you make um, your teammates feel like the company is also theirs and it wasn't just me? Ah, got it. In the early days, before they were owners, um, people felt like they just were part of it. We were smaller. They felt like they're on the journey. They were being paid well, good bonuses. They just wanted to be, they just felt like they were on the team. You know, like a football, baseball, whatever team, they're, they're not owners of the team, but they feel like they're part of the team, even though the owner's up in the box, you know, watching the game. They, they just feel like, we're the team, we're the one we're having, you know, this is all us. I think what's helped though, is because we became an ESOP in 2009, um, that they are actual owners of the company. Um, so people benefit from being, being owners. And again, we're one of the rare companies in our industry that um, our employees are owners through a employee stock ownership plan. Um, yeah, anything else, Rich, you would add onto that? Um, Owner. Yeah, I mean, I mean like yeah. part of it, ownership. 
Yeah, that's that's part of it. I, I think even before we had the employee stock ownership plan, or as Gary is calling it an ESOP, we already had an ownership culture at Cliff Bar, and that's because I mean, I'll speak because I'm, I'm I'm in my 22nd year, and that is we bought into it. We were, were the employees are really loyal to Gary's and Kit's vision of what we're trying to do, and you just want to be a part of something that's different and progressive, and and um, it matches your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And um, and you have this sense of pride that when you wear a Cliff Bar jacket um, public and someone goes, hey, I know Cliff. And you're like, yeah, I work there. And you're like really proud to say that you work there. Um, to me, that's 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 what it's all about. Yeah, I think our I think our values help. I think the fact that we're yeah. not in business just for the bottom line. Uh, you have an environmental focus and community service focus. And, um, you know, we... We probably do uh, sometimes feel like we do too much for our employees. <laughs> I mean, we've got so many things for our employees that it's, it's, uh, it, and so they all feel like, yeah, we're really being well taken care of. And so we're going to work hard for this company because it's, uh, so I, that's another, you know, uh, recommendation for anybody getting into business. You can't do everything we're doing. We didn't do it all at once it grew over time. We didn't have a gym for the first several years. Now we have a gym and full-time trainers. And then we have a childcare center and and an in-house cafe and all that. But that just incrementally went over years and uh, I grew over years. Um, So yeah, it all, it all add, it all contributes to the the feeling of um, feeling like you're, you're, you're part of it. All right, thank you. Hope that helps. We all want some type of award or like happiest place to work or something. I feel like you've you've had to. Yeah, so- we've we've had the you know best places to work awards through Outside Magazine and Forbes and and so on. Um, uh, those are those are tricky, you know, because you know you're they interview the employees and they know they're going for the award and, and so on. But um, I mean, I think between my wife and I, we just really do it uh, what we feel is right at the right time. Our, I think our childcare center is one of the um, biggest uh, uh, contributions to our employees that we've done. And it's, it doesn't pencil out as our CFO would tell you there in the in the left hand corner, um, but it is one of those benefits if you're a parent and you can walk over to you see your child at eleven o'clock and just check in with them or or have lunch with them or um, you know at the end of the day the childcare center thing and you guys are all young but if a parent has to go pick up a kid at a childcare center down the street it's like for every minute you're late it's like five bucks or ten bucks right, to pick up your kid. Well, Cliff Bar, you can just, if it's 5.30 and it's time to, and it's done, you just go pick up your kid and bring him back to your desk and have him run around your desk while you're finishing up your work. Um, it's one of the best, coolest things we've, we've done. And, and people feel really, you know, like part of, part of the whole work-life balance when, when we did that. My wife could explain it. It doesn't pencil out in an Excel spreadsheet, (laughs) but it it pencils out when you take in all the externalities or the qualitative aspects of it. Not life isn't all about quantitative thinking. You have to see like, so those employees who have their, their children in childcare, you know, they're, they're less stressed as Gary says, they're more productive. And that does, you see that return somewhere down the road. Yeah. It's not obvious, but it's either that person's loyal to the company and you're, and you're avoiding all these turnover costs that come with it, or they're telling their friends how Cliff Bar is a great place to work and you attract other people into Cliff Bar. It's, and, and that talent, that, that stuff is, that's real. It really is. I have one more do, um, Armin, maybe, can we just do one more at 7.30 and yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know about yeah. you guys, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm gonna have to go. Yeah, the, the questions are actually done, but one little, one little wrap up question. Uh, yeah. I think everything that I've and I've gone from this, uh, what y'all said, you know, I'm I'm sure, Rich, when uh, something like the gym or private trainers are proposed, you were just looking at. Um, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Real quick, oh my, oh, I okay, I forgot that. 
I'll get back to it. Uh, you were looking at like, oh my, like how would we even do this? Like money wise, it makes no sense. And I'm sure stuff like that has happened a lot of times, Gary, where, you know, something made sense in like the bigger scope that didn't have to do with profits. And so in terms of your team and the people who work on um, work in the company, do you think you were able to attract, you know, like-minded people who are okay with turning over a little bit of profit for something bigger and more important, according to like, you know, the five aspirations and all that stuff? Do you think they were attracted by your business model? Like, did it just flush out the people who didn't care about it as much as you did? You know, how was that team, all like-minded people, you know, established? Um, it, it feels like 9.9% .9 of the, 99.9% .9 of the people that come to Cliff Bar uh, know when they're applying that they're applying for a company that has purpose and that they want, they want to work for a different, like our new like our new ceo sally grimes who came from tyson and um not everything at tyson is bad as you've heard in the news but she really wanted to work for a company that um and she is remarkable we're really lucky to have her um and she wanted to work for a company that is purpose-driven um, she knew everything about it. So I think most people now that apply at Cliff Bar aren't coming because just because uh, we make an energy bar and because we pay pretty well and we're, we have an ESOP. I think, I think the ESOP is good, but it's not the driver. It's, you know, being an owner, coming in and having the opportunity to be an owner of the company. And, <clears throat> and look, our, our stock price is based on, you know, an ESOP valuation and, um, it's fair. And um, I don't think all of these things we're spending money on like organic and child care center and all that affects our ESOP value. I think that all actually increases our, our ESOP value. So they're not sacrificing um, value by coming to a company that is run with purpose, but they feel, um, they feel whole, you know, um, knowing that they're, they're, what they're doing is making a difference and, and is, uh, I don't, know, don't want to be grandiose, but you know, it's, it's a different, it, we're changing the world of business um, in a small way. And it would be great if some of the big companies could, could, and some are trying, but could really um, take our model of, of five bottom lines, five aspirations and, and make it real and commit to it, even if it affected their bottom line a little bit. That's awesome. I think it's very important for young entrepreneurs like us to hear that, you know, because we're, we're the future, you know, the big companies are going to be. Right. Running. So um, yeah, thank you so much for coming out, Gary Rich. We really appreciate it. This was an amazing opportunity. Um, I can't say thank you enough. The comments are going to be flooding with thank you right now. Um, well, tell the group, tell the group, uh, thank you for hanging um, the, the traffic air traffic control Thank you for saying three minutes I in. but rich rich covered well i know i know he did and uh, i appreciate you guys hanging on uh, thank you so much